Hi, this is Kelly Borsheim. I'm a sculptor and a painter, and we're going to be talking today about making a mold of my bas-relief sculpture. Now, a relief sculpture is um, when you compress form, okay? So, you've seen bas-relief means, it's a French word for low, low relief. That's going to be where you compress form into a flat, flat, flat space, such as a coin. And then you have also a high relief, which is more like a sculpture in the round that you just sort of cut off the back so you can hang it on a wall, okay? This one is somewhere between high relief and bas relief, closer to high relief, because I've got a lot of 3D. You can't see it from your angle, I know. But um, I'm not supposed to lift heavy things up <laughs> anyway, but um, we're going to talk about mold making because what I wanted to do is make a two-part mold first. A rubber mold that's flexible and it pulls off and then I'm going to put fiberglass because I realized I just had some fiberglass mold as a mother mold to support it something hard and rigid that later if I decide to make a bronze sculpture from this I can pour in the wax hot wax and then um, the solid fiberglass mold you can make it out of plaster too but I, I prefer fiberglass for a lot of reasons one is that when the foundry is moving the wax around um, they don't get little pieces of plaster falling off into the wax because that's a dirty casting. Anyway, um, this plastilina has wax based and uh, a lot of plastilinas have oil based in them. Some of them have sulfur. You don't want that if you're going to use rubber next. You always have to think about process. And so, anyway, with this process here, I'm making a face to go behind a water fountain, a, a spigot. Uh, rubinetto is what they call it in Italian. So I designed something different with that, which I'll talk about later when I get into casting. But what I decided to do is it's going to be an outdoor piece and the, the clients in this area especially don't want to pay a lot of money for stuff. So I said if I can make a mold and maybe sell multiple copies, I can recuperate my design time, my sculpture time, as well as the mold time and all the and getting individuals. So what I want to do is save my work and have the ability to make the whole face into a bronze sculpture later, okay? So I'm going to do the two-part mold. But I'm thinking to give them the clients a choice of a terracotta sculpture or a concrete cement sculpture. So in that respect, I want to make, once I finish with this mold, I'm probably going to try a just a straight plaster mold because there aren't a lot of undercuts in here and I can fill in the nose holes for the plaster cut because underneath here it's an undercut. You won't be able to... If you do a hard plaster mold as the only mold, I have to be able to pull it straight off the face with no undercuts, no ripping, no tearing. Otherwise, the sculpture is not going to happen because it'll get caught up in the mold and you either have to break the mold to get it out or you have to break the piece and then try to glue it together again. So either one of those are not really ideal. If you plan ahead and most importantly design ahead. Okay? So um, I want to do that for a couple of reasons. One is that when you put in clay into a mold you need a way to get it out. There's so much water in a clay that being up against a rubber that's not breathing means it's going to stay wet there. So a plaster mold, on the other hand, can absorb a lot of that water in, and then your clay can dry from the inside out and you can pull it out. So those are the things that are going through my head right now. And um, let me get started, okay? Hi, this is Kelly Borsheim. I'm a sculptor. And I'm working today on starting a mold making, um, making a mold of my sculpture. What I have here, which you can't see from that point of view, but you can from this one, is that I have a face, a man's face, in surprise, he's got a mustache. Last night I made a little bit more detail in the hair, just implying the hair to get, mostly because I wanted a contrast differentiating from the face. And um, anyway, these are all here and there. I prepared the mold as best I could, uh, for mold making as best I could by going in and making sure all the little holes that were along the edge from my putting clay on here and there are all filled in so that the rubber doesn't slip underneath anything because it doesn't really give you anything. And um, so I'm ready to start the mold making. When I do this, I really have to focus and I get all of my supplies together and um, get everything prepared. I have extra gloves in case one these break. I have a spoon for digging out the rubber. 
Um, I've got the chemicals and even the next tube ready going in, as well as my cheat sheet formula sheet to tell me how much of this for each of that. Now, I wanted to point out that I bring, uh, I bought a, a new scale here that's a little bit more fine because I had a difficult time making a mold of Stuart, the portraits bronze commission that I did, because I didn't have a way to measure small amounts of grams. So, but one thing I want to point out with these is you've got a dial up here to set it to zero, but watch what happens. If I set this to zero here, set it to zero, but I'm not going to mix it. So if I'm going to mix something on top of the scale, I have to put the bowl in. But I don't want the bowl to count. Hi, Yoda. <laughs> I don't want the bowl to count as part of the weight because it'll change the formula. So I want to come down here, not have my hair hanging in it to add weight to it, you see, because that would do the same problem in opposite. And uh, I'm only doing this so you can see it. So that's going to be zero there. The same thing's going to happen on my small scale. Is I'm going to put this on top. They make a little square thing to sort of lock this in a little bit. And the same thing, the knob is up here, and I'm going to move it down to zero. Um, I get this would probably be classified as um, calibrating something. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having. My brain doesn't work after my back injury, so I broke two vertebrae in my spine. I'm still recuperating from it after six months. But anyway, forget about that. I'm doing the best that I can to go forward with stuff. I can't lift anything heavy, so my neighbor brought in the plaster for me. <laughs> okay, so let's get this party started, right? All right. <laughs> I saw when I was setting up the video again that... Um, these scales are not at zero, as I had mentioned in an earlier segment, that I don't know if it's settled in later or if it's just from my point of view, I was looking at it weird, but there's a knob up here on the scale and you can adjust it, turning it one way or the other until this red needle, you want it right at zero and with the bowl that you're going to use to measure so that you're actually just measuring the materials inside the bowl and not also the bowl or not also my hair or my finger pushing down like the Norman Rockwell drawing. So maybe I should turn this toward me. And ideally when you do this, of course, you should have it sitting onto the table because any kind of stuff like that's a variable. So let's see if that's better. That's better. You know, the other thing is your point of view. <laughs> it's just like trying to draw a live model. It's going to depend on what your point of view is. I see also this one looked like it was heavy. Now, this is a smaller one that's supposed to be more precise. We'll see if it is. All right, so I have these turned here so you can see the front of the scales and all this sort of thing. This is the chemical that basically starts to activate things. And then in this bucket here, which I... I don't have the ability to lift up right now because it's it's too heavy. I'm not supposed to lift anything heavy. And I just passed the six month mark of this um, operation. So I'm a little bit freaked out by that. Uh, anyway, um, I'm supposed to open this somehow. I usually close them really, really tight because I don't want to lose the extra material. And that looks like that might be an opening there. Oh, you know what? This may be a brand new bucket. I may have used up just the entire first, I had to buy two buckets because I was doing a, a larger than life portrait commission and I wasn't sure how much material I would need and I had to drive an hour to get it and um, didn't want to do that again. So this is probably a new segment. Oh. Okay, da 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> it's so easy now, isn't it? My neighbor came over to open it for me, so that was really nice. I'm going to turn these around so that I can actually see what's doing on. Um, oh, also, I thought that I should point out, I had tilted this up a little bit so that I could work from this side looking at the face here and see the perspective and all this sort of thing. But if I usually to do a bronze mold on clay like this you put a much more liquidy rubber you use two different kinds of rubbers one is very liquidy and it flows all into all of the little tiny details really minute stuff it's amazing what it can do 
and then while it's still wet and it you get things will stick to it you come in with a thicker rubber like this one and you put it on top and you build up your layers with the stronger rubber because obviously the more liquid stuff it could tear if you didn't have a stronger thing after it but when I did the sculpture of Stuart I took a photo of my sculpture it wasn't finished yet but you had enough to see what sort of details I was putting into the hair and the eye holes and you know different things like that to give him an idea but also for the size and he told me to only I only needed to use this but as I'm pushing it in I need to make it I need to really push it in so that it will go into all of the little detail things it was against my understanding of doing that and of course I'm afraid that I'm going to ruin my sculpture in clay if I don't do it right the first time. So I asked him specifically, isn't there a thinner rubber that I can put on for what we call the print coat, meaning it's going to take the actual, touching the actual surface of the original, is the print coat. And he said, no, not with the kind of detail that you have. This is going to be very easy and you, ju you just need to be firm with how you push it in. So that's another reason I'm glad it's mid-February because even though where I live it doesn't snow it in February kind of thing. It rarely snows here, maybe once or twice a year, this year nothing. But um, the clay here is cold enough in that when I push against it, it's not going to just give because this clay is quite sensitive to temperature. So anyway, um, I just wanted to point that out, that what I'm using now is a simpler process, but it's a higher risk that I'm going to miss something. However, this sculpture is very similar to the other one, and I want to use up materials that I already had, uh, and I didn't want to drive an hour to get something special when I specifically asked this man about it, and he said, you don't need it. So, um, asked and answered, and of course, you know, the, the thing is, sometimes people tell you what you want to hear, because they know that it doesn't affect their lives at all, and you're thinking, oh man, you just totally ruined what I was doing or whatever. But in the case of somebody trying to sell materials, my feeling is that they probably would benefit from selling me more materials, even if they feel like they're not necessary. So if he was a smart person, business person I mean, um, he would have said, oh, she kind of doesn't feel good about having that other liquid rubber, okay, well, I'll sell it to her. On the other hand, what you don't always know is sometimes he's not going to say, yes, you need this other rubber because he doesn't have it in stock. So you really got to be careful with that and try to keep asking questions from as many different directions and all this sort of thing to figure out what's really going on. I hate to say that, but it's been my experience. Anyway, um, I got a strong metal spoon to scoop out the rubber. I don't know if you can see that it's very putty-like. It's kind of hard, but because it doesn't have the activator in it, it hasn't set up. And in this particular bucket, it wasn't open, so I could have stored it for quite a long time because the other mold that I made was in uh, April of last year. Okay, so now this I have, I probably shouldn't put it on an inclined table. Oh, well, I know what I was going to say about the inclination. The um, if I were using a more liquid rubber, I would lay this thing flat, probably, just to not have everything running off the board this way at me, okay? So I would make it all horizontal. Right now, because I'm using this stiff stuff, I think it might be a little easier for me to stay in this position and um, be able to focus on that. However, when I do the fiberglass, well, maybe not the fiberglass because it's a pretty solid material. However, when I start to do the gesso mold only, I will build an actual border, probably follow along a little bit beyond these lines that I made for the face measurement, and, um, and then I can just pour in the plaster and not worry about details. I just have to make sure that the side walls that I put, one, are high enough, and two, are sealed at the edge here so that the plaster doesn't leak out, because you can imagine that would be more fun than you probably wanted to have. <laughs> so, all right. My um, measuring thing, where was it? No, I can't find it. You know, the also thing with this, I've become Butterfingers. Maybe I just turned that upside down. I did, I turned it upside down. I drop a lot of things now, and that's very frustrating to me. 
that I just don't seem to be able to. So I, I, I'm waiting for my physical therapy to start and um, hope that it works. All right, so it's a 4 to 5 percent is what this activator should have compared to the weight of this. And it's all measured in grams. So I'm going to scoop out. What I want to do is just make enough rubber for me to be able to hold the supply here and then use my, I'm right-handed generally, so to use my right hand to push on this and still have enough material so that I don't have to mix the chemical every single time I push stuff in there. So anyway, um, I don't know if I remember how much I, I did on the original sculpture, but probably just enough to fit in comfortably to your hand. Being April, it would have been warmer when I did this. Okay, so I want to double check my scale that it says zero, at least from the point of view where I'm standing, and drop that in there. Okay, so that says 100, and 4% would be 4, so I'm going to add a little bit more just because that just might be a little bit annoying to have to I'm not sure if this scale, if this scale says 4 quite easily. See it says 40. So this scale is not as subtle as I thought it would be. So I'm going to go a little bit higher, but wait a minute, 40 might be 4%. Grace Kelly strikes again. All right, so this is a thousand grams, one kilogram, and uh, so it's a thousand, and that says forty. So twenty is what I'm shooting for. So let's see what that would give me. Five percent would be. That means I should really mix up uh, five hundred grams of this this section. And right now, I'm, well, that sounds like a whole lot. So what I may have to do is, see, that's probably more than I want to mix up at a time. But um, you can see I'm not the most graceful. So there's a 40 and there's a 20. I can probably guesstimate at a 10. So 10, let's say at 5% to make life easy. Okay, I don't know what to do. Well, I'm already at 300. So 300 times 10% is 30. And 15 would be 5%. So I wonder if I can get away with that. We're going to see. Now, memory serves that in the beginning I put too much liquid uh, of this mixer in it. It was, it turned yellow really fast and it got hard really fast and you had to move really fast. That's not a good solution for a print coat. But on the other hand, if you make it not activated at all, the rubber will never heal up and then you're kind of out of luck. So let's sit this on a solid thing here. Try to move where I can see it. And then is this 300, so 300, move the decimal over, that's 30 is 10%, 15 is what I'm going for. All right. I don't know if you can see that yellow there, so that's 20. So I'm gonna, let's let that go. Now, the thing is, this says between four and 5%. That dump bound to zero, that's, oh no, because my point of view was different. No, that dump bound to, all right, so I just had uh, the delusion with the um, manufacturer of this. Look at that. This is not the price of science. Um, so what I'm going to do, what just happened here, is I'm trying to sit at the same point of view, and while I was sitting here, the weight that's still in the bucket there, um, It moved, the scale moved back to zero, so this means that I bought a very low quality scale, and that's disappointing. So I'm going to try to work from memory, which this is not ideal here, 
but I'm hoping I remember enough about the color because I want a pale yellow color. Now, if it's too white, it's not never going to set up. And on that other mold that I had, I did a really poor job of it because I worked until 3 a.m. I was really upset because I hired an assistant who had experience making mold for other sculptors and at the last minute she decided to criticize me for not getting that sec that first coat, print coat of rubber even though she was supposed to go with me to the supply store and I went to the supply store a month ahead of time knowing that I wanted to get this is insane so what I if this does this with the latex rubber gloves, which maybe it is going to, I don't know, maybe it sticks to everything, then I'm going to do this with my naked hands. But I don't remember having this problems. However, I think I used an actual different type of glove. That may be an issue. So here you get to watch me making my mistakes online with you. I'm going to take this off. and. I will tell you that one of the problems that I have is that I'm a habitual nail biter. I don't actually bite the nail, it's probably, I do bite them when they're too long because they've been knowing me to have long nails. But I, um, let me start, see how yellow that is compared to the white? And right there. So I worry sometimes if I take chances like this with chemistry, which is not a bright thing to do really. I worry that it's going to enter my bloodstream easier because I've made so many disgusting things happen in my fingers. All right, I can tell already that this scale did not give me the right dimension because even at this stage, I should be seeing a little bit more. I don't know that I should be making this mold right now because seriously, to squeeze things, even when I try to wash laundry and squeeze out things, it's too much for my shoulder blade muscles. So let's see if I can maybe use this cover here just to not squeeze out too much directly onto my chemical, you know what I mean? And you know, the good thing about me doing this is that if I screw it up, <laughs> I'm not going to be angry at anybody else except me. Which, to be fair, doesn't make me a nice person to be around, but obviously it's better that I'm angry at myself for what I did than angry at somebody else for that because you get in a rock and a hard place when somebody else screws up your sculpture. You know what I mean? Even when people try to help me carry stuff out of shows and things, even paintings, you think, okay, but if you drop it or if it doesn't make it into my van when I saw you carried out kind of thing, you know, we're going to have a problem here because um, I've lost something, but are you going to pay me back for that? Or are you going to give me an apology only? Or, what? you know, how do I deal with this loss? That's a very real thing. So that's a lot of times why sculptors don't want to get, loan out their tools to people. Not everybody feels that way, but my maestro did, and I think it's a good sense because this still doesn't look right. This is, I'm wondering if I did the math wrong or something. It's, it's, it's between four or five percent. So if I had a 300 gr 500 gram, it would be 20 grams. That says I have 300, and I'd already calculated that 300 should mean 12, gram, 12 to 15 grams, which I did. And I can tell you that this is not the same color that I remember, although it's in the daytime. I don't know if this means... I think I want to err on the side, which I probably shouldn't do, because... Anyway... I'm almost wondering if I have the instructions wrong. This says 5% on here. 300 times 5% is 0 0.05. It's going to be 30. It's going to be a 15 because it's half of 30. But it has a zero on it, so maybe it's not going to be 150. I feel like this is probably too much yellow stuff that I put in here. Um, but let's see if I can get a really good mixture. This is a lot 
more troublesome to do. When I was mixing this up before and work until three in the morning to get this done, because um, I was up against a serious deadline, and when my assistant decided at the last minute to f try to force me to go shopping, and even though it was after eight, seven or eight p.m. or whatever, nothing was going to be open that I could certainly get to in time. Plus, had I known there was a rubber supplier closer to me, I would have already done all that. Plus, I'd already made my decision. I was going to follow the instructions of the manufacturer or the seller and see where it goes. So, I didn't appreciate that. So, when she went home to have dinner, I decided I'm just going to start working so that I don't want to hear how stupid I am. So, I'm stubborn that way and I probably sabotage myself. But, you know, sometimes... When you're trying to get something done, especially when you're stressed because you know you're late, you know you've had a client who's been picky and picky and picky, and it doesn't matter what you say about April 15th as a deadline, you're still going up till the 26th making changes on the sculpture, and you go, that was my problem for not controlling that better, but I had to get on a plane, and I had to have the mold finished, and it had to go with me, so I was kind of up, up against something. Now, I can feel that this... It's still flexible. It's kind of a pale yellow. I mean, I could compare it to that white if I wanted, but I don't want to open up the jar. So I'm going to take in little pieces, very malleable, thin pieces, and I'm going to stick it into the eyes. Why the eyes? Doesn't matter. You start wherever makes you comfortable. But I'm kind of hoping that... I mean, technically, I probably should have started in the hair or something that wasn't a critical thing if I get it wrong. But some part of me thinks, worries, that my energy is quite limited and I'm not going to be able to do this the way I would like. So I'm hoping that if I do the critical parts while I'm still sort of energetic and new and hopefully a little bit smart, then maybe this will go better. So I'm really trying to push it into the details, and yet I want to make sure things like the eyelid that might be a little more fragile, I want to push in a certain direction so that I don't change the shape of those details. You see what I mean? So. And the mold, it is probably about 3 o'clock right now. If I am able to, well, I am able, I'm doing whatever I want to, plus with this back stuff, I have to rest more than usual. Um, I am able to. I will wait at least overnight, depending on when I finish this thing. But this, this sculpture is not nearly as large as the other one, and so I'm hoping that now, I also know that I pushed grooves into the hair in this direction of the eyelashes, I mean the eyebrows. So I want to sort of pull things along to fill in those fine lines that I gave. And again, I'm glad that the clay is hard because if the clay was soft, this would be not the task I would be doing. I would probably, in that event, I would go back to that guy or I would find another supplier that had the the liquid rubber and I would pour it all in because otherwise all of this stuff that you see me pushing against that soft clay all the detail would change and I would come up with making a mold of a deformed sculpture and um, it could be a really ugly nasty thing you know so the other thing I don't want to do because again I'm hoping that I can finish with this but I don't want to leave any little stragglers, like a random little thing here or something that's not touching the face, or the sculpture, I should say, because it doesn't matter what you're making. Um, I don't want anything to be stuck that's going to harden later, and if I'm able to have, to, if I have to wait for whatever reason. Now, see here, I've got a little any for the hair. I really want to push that in because my the main thing I'm trying to do is avoid air bubbles. Okay, so that's why a lot of times I'm trying to push in one direction and do it in a way that the air can escape instead of being blocked in. Okay, 
And I don't know if that shows up there. Hopefully on, on my phone here it's still recording. And um, you can get a better view of this, how it's happening. Because, you know, I shouldn't want to do everything alone, but sometimes just living alone I get where I don't want to wait for people to show up on their schedule. And um, a lot of times people have ideas that they want to eat at a certain time, they want to do this, and <laughs> I mean, oh, I sound like I'm complaining because people want to eat. Of course people want to eat. I also like to eat. But um, in today's case, I actually ate lunch about 11, knowing that it was going to take me time to get all this stuff together, and I didn't want the distraction of feeling hungry while I'm trying to speak to you. So, anyway. If you have any questions about the process, or even critiques, I don't mind those, um, go ahead and put those in the comments. If you can, like the video if you want to get more of my funky little con content about sculpture and art. Go ahead and subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you're notified every time I publish something new on uh, YouTube. Um, it's all up to you. It doesn't cost anything. And, uh, you know, I'm not averse if you want to send me money for whatever, but that's here nor there. Okay. And another thing I'm trying to do is make a consistent thickness of the mold and as well as besides just avoiding um, air bubbles I want to remember to make some kind of special point so that when I put the hard mother mold on there I can register the mold and they can sort of lock together but not in a way that they can't come apart but just to register things so that I get the support I need. So I pushed all that in there, but I'm really trying now to, to get that in. I can go over with some thicker rubber after I get this print cold, but the print code, uh, coat excuse me, is, is the, mo the most important thing, obviously. And that's why I'm really hoping I mis mix this rubber well enough, because my fear is that it hasn't turned yellow yet. I mean, it hasn't become hard to work and starting to set up, so I'm a little bit nervous that I didn't put enough mixture into this and it's going to be gooey, which means I'm going to exaggerate that for you. Maybe you'll see what I'm talking about later, but although the fact that it's sticking to my hands, I don't remember having this problem last time, so I'm wondering if I should have gone back to my computer and re-listened to the video of what the man told me about this. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm a little bit nervous. I do remember that the mold set up quite quickly when I started. Um, and if this is too rubbery and it never sets up, then I've just wasted all my time. The material I don't mind because I still think even if I throw this part away, I can do this small sculpture again with what material I've left. And if not, then I just do something else. I don't know. Make the plaster mold and be done with it. But the thing with sculpture is it's so difficult to earn a living with it. One, because the market's smaller, but two, when I make a painting, even if I take months and months to work on it, which some paintings that sell fast are basically nothing and they don't take a lot, but painters often complain about, oh, the price of frames and oh, this and, well, great, they have the options to sell the painting without the frame even show it without the frame. These days people are getting more casual even about that. But everybody knows that paint may be expensive, but it's not nearly, maybe doesn't everybody knows, maybe nobody thinks about it, but I don't feel sorry for painters when they complain about prices because the price on their painting that they can get is far more personally what they're going to get because the expenses of the materials and even the labor is so much less than sculpture and the market for paintings is so much larger so they also have a lot more leeway in attempting in uh, pricing 
they have leeway in you know how to ship things you can take the canvas if you want to paint on canvas you can take that and roll it in a tube instead of having to pay high shipping fees or even if the customer wants to save money they don't have to buy your frame they can go to the frame shop and <laughs> a lot of times actually the client pays more for the frame than he pays for the artwork that's not a lie at all especially on the smaller pieces but anyway I'm a little bit worried because I have no concept of time but it feels to me that even though this is sticky I'm not sure that it's going to set up well but time will tell won't it I kind of lost my confidence on the face a little bit, but also um, I wanted to push into this hair because sometimes as I'm talking to you, or I suppose myself too, I um, kind of change my mind about what might be the smartest thing to do at the first glance. Uh, in the end, if this mold is sort of okay, but not great, I'll do what I did with the Stewart's one is it means that I have a lot more work to do in the wax. Now in that case it was unfortunate because I had to travel to a new place and I had to work in somebody's foundry and that's not really an ideal thing if you've got a lot of work in the wax. But in this case when I'm doing this home and I'm going to try to make terracotta or I would make a wax copy here and then bring the wax copy to the foundry locally, then it doesn't matter if I have to do a lot of wax work because I can do that in the comfort of my own home without judgment, without taking up somebody's space or time or, um, you know, anything. And uh, that's, you know, that's part of my problem is I tend to be a loner. And that might be also another reason that I like stone carving, but because pretty much that's me from almost day one. I've had help from various people at times to do bases and installation and drill holes in it so you can mount the piece, that sort of thing. But in general, okay, I don't know how much, I should have probably been timing this, but I don't know how much time this mixture has happened and I'm a little bit worried that I didn't put enough stuff in it although it's weird because I'm doing the math unless the scales are really bad which is quite possible um, I could be totally screwing up although this is starting to get kind of hard isn't it I just don't remember it taking this long to get hard. But that's another reason to mix up the small batches. Because if you mix up too much and you don't have the ability or don't have another person even to be working on pushing the rubber into a, another part of the sculpture, then you could be wasting a lot of material because it'll set up too fast and you have to throw it away. Because once it starts to harden, it's not going to mold into your shapes. You know, it may work on an outer coat to sort of stick to something, but... Anyway, talking too long. Leave your comments, leave your critics, critiques, leave your questions, and comment, like, subscribe, and if you want, share this video with anybody you think might actually enjoy seeing how molds are made for sculpture. And again, this is somewhere between a high relief and a bar relief. Bar relief would be flat like coins and this is even from your point of view you can probably tell this is not flat like a coin would be flat with the sculpture shapes so this is more of a high relief sculpture it may be four inches in the total depth maybe what is that 10 or 12 centimeters okay now Here's the thing, this may end up being like plaster. One of the reasons I'd never enjoyed plaster sculpture was because I spent more time in the mixing bowl cleaning it out. Because if you leave any little bit of plaster in the bowl, 
The next time you go to mix plaster, it's going to set up faster because it's connecting to the stuff that you've already got existing there. And I find that a bit annoying. And I'm not a person who enjoys cleaning anyway. I don't find it peaceful as some people do. I don't find it comforting to be organizing other people's stuff or even my own stuff. I mean, yeah, there's some of that, but um, I'm saying that's not the mentality I would have is that I would be happy to mix and clean bowls all the time. I want to sculpt. That's, I don't want to spend my time mixing up materials, cleaning out stuff so I can mix them again. And But I can tell that the way my fingers are so sticky here that I'm probably going to go find a paper towel and wipe my hands off as much as I can before I put my spoon. Because if I touch that spoon, then it's going to get gunky and all that. And that may not be a big deal. Now, because I'm working, I want to not contaminate my stuff before I finish that thought and move on to the next. Now, I'm really hoping also that this stuff isn't going to have air bubbles because it's quite thick. And also the form that I made is relatively a simple shape. So to do all this now, I'm no longer going to be pushing into fine detail because it could be that this stuff is setting up too much. And so I'm going to do, can you see where some of the clay is on highlights? If I can see the dark color of the clay coming out against the light color of this, then that means I don't have a lot of material there. And that, I mean, if I don't, if I don't see the clay at all, I just see the darkness of the clay, then that means I did get a print coat on the that space, but I want to build up the rubber again for in for more consistent thickness and hope that it won't tear, you know, because if you start making, ideally, it could be that I could sell quite a lot of these because everybody has a water faucet outside of their house, don't they? A spigot to water the lawn or something. Um, maybe some people even do in the city if they have a balcony or something, maybe they want water to have a short little sink or something outside. But my point is that most people are going to have something that maybe they want something like this, maybe they don't. But it, it's not like a, a one-off sculpture, portrait sculpture of a specific person. There aren't many people that are going to want a copy of that. So um, Okay, so I could keep picking at my fingers here, but kind of what I want to do is sort of not smooth out all these little points but I don't want these little rubber things sticking up because they were pulling on to my hands and I'm afraid that if I don't keep going with the print coat here and even just finish the rubber in one stop that maybe it's not going to stick to itself as well as it did. I know that it probably has like maybe 24 hours because otherwise I couldn't have done this big half bigger than life portrait with a shoulder and the body as if it's coming out of water thing that I did with Stuart. And um, I worked till three in the morning that night. And then I got up at nine o'clock and I started again because I was just desperate to have it finished. Um, so, all right. So I want to tamp down any little points that are sticking up that are, you know, some people leave them and then when the rubber's dry, they cut them off. Um, depending how much you're working with thickness, you don't really need to be concerned about that until you do the last stage. But I tend to like to do that anyway, um, because you never know what's going to take or not. The other thing is I want to go around the edges here and make sure that I I got everything done. So I'm going to clean up and uh, get Artist Productions, more Sharm Art. Ooh, take 27. <laughs> really take one. Cool, huh? <laughs> So this is the natural color here, the white. I'm hoping that I put enough yellow in. Here is the color yellow when I put too much activator in and it just got really, really hard, really, really fast. And it was just too much of a good thing. 
So I'm hoping this was the rubber that I had extra left over from the last thing I did. So this is a little bit more yellow in parts. I can see there's a wee bit of white. And I don't know if that's because it's thinner or what, but you know, I'm starting to think this 5% it's maybe all relative, so I decided that I'm going to use the same scale because maybe they're not calibrated accurately. But at least if one of them says 5% on the same thing, that gives me the weight of something. Okay, so that's 300. Is it? No, that's 200. Okay, so that's 200. So 5% of 200. 10% would be 20, so 5% is going to be 10, right? Am I good on the math? And let me get rid of this stuff in my scale. Probably should have washed that right away, but maybe since it's not mixed, it'll wash okay uh, also later. I'm going to put this in my hands. No, no, I'm wrong. So 200. I want to go to 210, so I see 300, 350, 10 is going to be just one of those little spaces. Let's see if it's that, because that, nope. Yeah, that could be. So let's do that. I'm going to show you what it is also so I can remember. But you see, visually, you can see this much quantity of the, basically the starter or the chemical reaction thing. And then versus this much is 200 grams versus theoretically 10 of that, 5%. It's the maximum end of that. So theoretically, this should set up a little bit faster than slower than the 4% would. But, okay, so now... In, I don't, when I, as I mix this, again, note that I'm not using gloves because those yellow gloves that I had just stuck to this rubber like crazy. And I think I'd rather have it do it to my skin, which is not necessarily the safest thing to do. So don't do what I say, but I had a pair of a different type of gloves. I think they were nitrate -like latex. They were either blue or black and I looked all over and I cannot find them. So let's scrape this off the board. Find a clean part of the rubber there. Now, I've started over here with this. I want to add a little piece to that top part that I saw was um, empty. This is proportionally a lot more, I think, than what I did the last time. So we'll see how this may be too much of a good thing. Um, so we'll just see. You know, this is the thing where you, you realize that having experience with something is such a huge, huge help. This already feels like a darker yellow, but let me keep mixing. But I want to go fast because it could be that I have way too much stuff in there now, so I've gone the other direction from the other side. But I want to continue on with this so that it, it fixes to that. Okay. It's a little dark. It's a little darker than the yellow, but not too much. So where was the hole? I think it was right there. I'm going to fill that in now before I forget about it. And go right around there. Because there's no point in not having something. I, I carved detail all the way up into the flat section of the piece, too. Okay, you can't really see what I'm doing, but I'm pushing the rubber against the board into the sculpture because there's no point having a thin, skinny piece hanging out. Okay, I keep mixing this. So you can see it's actually quite tough because it's giving my back muscles a run for the money right now. And you can see it's a lot dark. It's not a lot darker, but it's a little darker than that. So I may have just done the exaggeration thing, which I tend to do. Okay, so again, I want to pull out a thinner piece. Make sure I'm making a video here. Yeah, it is, okay. It's Sometimes I think I'm making a video and I'm just in the video mode and it's waiting for me to push the button again. Now, you can't see this in the eye, but I had a thin line cut into the clay to indicate the outer section of the iris. And I wanna make sure that I can, I can kinda see that the rubber's pushed in there. 
And then of course I have a darker hole for the pupil, which that, but that's also a bigger one. It's the thin lines that I'm really worried about whooshing my way through. And again, I'm trying to push and drag sort of at the same time to allow air bubbles to escape if there are any in there. And the odds are there will be some in there, um, especially when I get into the detail here of this hair of the eyebrow. So when I sort of, I'd even much rather have a thinner coat at the beginning pushed in properly and then later add in the thicker coats, you know. But like I said, with the eyelash, I yeah, the not the eyelash, the eyelid before, I do want to make sure that my pushing is not going to change the shape of that eyelid and give him more of a droopy thing because he's supposed to have a surprise face. And that surprise face goes into the eyes, into the eyebrows, into the cheeks. Um, if you want an expression to actually carry off, you know, you need it to, the facial mu muscles work with each other. And, um, you know, it's funny how many books that I listen to a lot of audiobooks when I work because I don't need the visual and I, I like storytelling and plus I, I would like to write a book someday. I don't know if I will ever get around to it because there's too many things I want to do in life. But my point is that a lot of them will say, oh, they smile without reaching the eyes. And what they're talking about is a genuine smile will use the muscles in the eyes as well as in the mouth. And you can even hear it in somebody's voice on the phone if they're sort of fake smiling behind the scenes. You may not be able to see what their face is doing, but you kind of can hear it at times. Um, a, a lack of sincerity in, um, you know, what they think is being polite. But you, if you recognize that they're being sarcastic or just putting on a fake thing to sort of say face or lie or whatever it is that is going on there. Um, you can tell it, you don't particularly <laughs> appreciate it, but at the same time, it's always good information to have, isn't it? If somebody's trying to, isn't that, <laughs> what, is that right? <laughs> the Texan ladies say, when you're full of stuff, <laughs> when you're telling a lie and they know you are, and you know you are, <laughs> is that right? Except I don't have quite the Southern thing accent of the U.S. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Sometimes these little twangy things come out and I think, oh my gosh, did I just say that? And then when I speak to my cousins from Minnesota, where I was born, but I don't speak like them because I'd never lived there really for long enough to have done anything like that, but I start rounding my O's <laughs> like a Canadian, except in Minnesota we speak like that too. And except I just use we when that's not really me, but it is me. That's where I'm from. And uh, the land of 10,000 lakes as I ramble on and on. Okay, so here I'm gonna push down into that thing. I'm gonna push into these nostrils to get the shape right. And then I'm gonna drag this over the mustache hairs, really get out all of the um, air bubbles. That's why the liquid is so nice. But you know, even when people do the liquid stuff, a lot of times you'll see sculptors spray with um, compressed air to sort of push the rubbery, the liquidy rubber into, really get it into all the details, fine details of the sculpture and um, get rid of and blow out the air bubbles. Because you know, air bubbles just need a little bit of pressure and then boom, they're done. They, you open up one little crevice and you're, clay or your rubber in this case, and um, they're gonna escape and they can be filled. But of course you have to be careful how you fill it because you could fill it and create more air bubbles. So it's all, it's all interesting. And it's funny because if you do it wrong, you're gonna learn a lot and you may never do it again. But on the other hand, sometimes, you know, it's just stuff doesn't go perfectly and um, you can go forward with it anyway. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. However, 
It's a lot like building a house. The more work you put into the beginning part of the process um, and think while you're thinking about the end part of the process, the other steps, I should say, in the process, and you design accordingly, you end up having a better product in the end, especially because this is unlike stone carving. Stone carving is a direct process. I'm working directly with the rock, and however I finish carving it, that's how it's going to stay. And um, whereas bronze, you're making multiple copies of happen by the time you actually get to your finished bronze. Now, as I said in the earlier video segment, and I don't know if it made it onto it because it, I was going on for more than 20 minutes and the video cut off, but um, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, this may not be a bronze in the end. I wanted the option to that. And the other thing that I, the reason I designed this mustache to come out like that, not because I'm a fan of mustaches in particularly, but because I want to make, when I saw the design of my clients, they had just, the plumbing was still so new. So I wanted to design something that they wouldn't have to call the plumber to take off his work and do the installation of the face behind the faucet. You know, it's a little spigot coming out of a wall kind of thing. So my thought was that if I make a natural break in the face, that the top part comes over the lower part, it could be that I could make a face that looks like it's a solid piece, not have it be a solid piece, but also wrap it around the faucet. So the faucet's coming out of the guy's mouth. And look at this. So this is setting up a lot faster than the other one that I did. And that's that may or may not be okay. I mean, really just, it depends on how well I did this print coat, but, um, you know, we'll see what happens. Cause I did I have to remember I did the left eye with this rubber that's starting to set up. I'm going to push this into the mustache now early because the rest of the forms are relatively simple. But if I want to have this fine detail in the hair, I can feel and I know you can't, I'm sorry to say that, but you can see how darker the yellow is compared to the first layer of stuff. And I can feel that this is getting stickier and mushier. So I want to try to push it into all the areas of fine detail right now, because you can see that's a smooth area with the cheek. I probably have a lot more leeway in getting away with a harder rubber there than I do with this stuff that's just not, you know, um, I don't want it to be so tough. I can't get it into all those things. You know, I like to make complicated sculptures. I like to have undercuts. I like to play with the light. And playing with the light means you're going to have narrow spaces so you can get dark shadows. You're going to have open spaces so you can get light shadows. And um, I like playing with those changes and making something that to me is visually more interesting than it would be if I didn't go to the extra trouble. And um, because of that, I have more work to do. But, you know, it's when you create anything, it doesn't matter what it is, computer program or whatever, you know, I mean, make a cake. I mean, what the, the work that you want to put into it is usually dependent on how strong your vision is about this and how important certain aspects of it are. Okay, so now I'm going to finish this so I can... You know, one thing I was trying out of desperation when I did the mold of Stuart, um, and I knew that I, was ha I had mixed something up wrong, I started putting in the... Um, activator, I guess you call it, section, and just trying to hope that maybe I could just rub it on directly and somehow mix it in with the rubber that was there. <laughs> it didn't really work, but, you know, <laughs> what did I have to lose at that point? Because I was just running out of time. How do you get on an airplane in less than three days when you've got to be making this mold and have it going with you? So I um, should never, ever, ever let a client control me to that point. Uh, so... We'll see what happens. But, you know, the other thing is part of problem with my personality, but maybe it's actually not really a bad thing that, that I basically 
did everything that he wanted, even if it was ridiculously beyond my deadline that I told him about, is I feel like if somebody's going to pay for art, I want them to have good feelings about it. I want them to have what they want. And um, I don't want somebody to look at the piece and go, I really wanted her to do this, and she didn't do it, and so I'm stuck with this kind of thing. You know, um, on the other hand, there is a point where sometimes that round and around stuff just, it's too much to be practically useful. And, um, you know, it's, and a lot of people honestly don't necessarily want to pay for the extra amount of labor they're putting you through. Um, they want what they want. And the, the, the biggest problem really gets to be that we we don't read each other's minds very well, so it really depends on how well people can communicate. But to be fair, myself, I don't sometimes know what I want until I see what I don't want. You know what I mean? That's that's why I was telling a friend of mine that wanted my help to help her, help her find a place to live. Is um, I said, well, let's go see a bunch of places. Well, I'm not ready to buy. I said, I know, but the offer is there to go look at the apartment. And I love looking at houses, but also, even if you know you're not going to buy it, if that person's willing to show you that house anyway, why not go see it? Because you're going to see stuff and go, oh, I never thought about putting in a built-in shelf in the wall or, you know, whatever. But I think that's really a cool use of the space. Or, you know, maybe, oh, I don't want a bathroom that has a triangular window because it's such a weird angle. Or maybe I don't want a balcony that faces this. Or, you know what I'm saying? Is the more you look, the more you inform yourself. I mean, but to be fair, it's like people who re wear really cool vintage clothes. They don't just find that stuff on a whim. It, it takes time to go shopping and to go buy the things, to know yourself, to know what looks good on your body, to know what colors you actually feel good in and, and you know that kind of thing. I mean most of us do that slowly over time anyway but my point is that most things that look effortless probably had a lot of effort that went into them and uh, okay so I have I'm gonna go clean off again my my stuff here. Can you see the difference in the yellow here from this point of view? I don't know um, but I can spend all day trying to pick at this and put it on there, but I think it's just better for me to start doing this and trying to get as much of this off my hands and mix up the last chin part, fill in a places where I can see some of the clay is covered with mold, but it's so transparent I can see the color of the clay underneath and even like here and here on the mustache, which you might be able to see from your angle. Um, right there even, a little bit there. I can build those up with the last bit of whatever remains when I fill in the mouth here. So I'm gonna shut the video off now, go clean up my hands, and we'll photograph the last section. Thanks for staying with me and add your comments and your questions to this video. Thank you so much. This is Kelly Borsheim. Check out my finished pieces at borsheimarts.com and you can follow me here on YouTube. Ciao, ciao. All right, let's see if we can finish up this puppy again. So I got the eye here and the mustache here. And that means for this, I think there's less real estate, it's simpler, but I am going to want to fill in some holes. And another thing that I want to consider is that the mother mold, which we call the supporting mold, the rigid mold, that's going to support the flexible stuff so that you don't change the form. As you pour things into the flexible, it's possible, it's possible to stretch it. But you want the flexible to come away from all these parts, right? So I want to think about this. This is a piece that's on a board. My hard mother mold needs to come away from the board, okay? Tomorrow, I'll probably wax the board so that it's easier to separate so it doesn't stick to the wood, okay? If I don't, remind me. <laughs> I don't know how that would work. Anyway, <laughs> what a goofball. But anyway, what I want to think about is this idea of pulling away the, the mold that can't bend or flex. So I want to make sure I don't have an undercut in the nose, for example. 
These eyes, they're all inner sockets, but from this point of view, they pull up. If I were making a mother mold where it was coming off this way, for some reason separating the face, and if it was a larger sculpture, for example, then these would obviously make an undercut on this side pulling from this side. So you wouldn't do that that way, but a lot of times you're not going to design a mold that way. And I do want to state, when I'm working with a foundry, I speak to the actual foundry that will be doing the work because... They all work in a slightly different way. So one may want you to cut it here, another may want you to cut it there. And so the things, if, if you communicate with the people who are involved in the process further down the line, and then you design in a way that works with their brains or their method or their process, you're going to be, get a much better off, uh, a better product. And you're also going to get a better result, I should say. You're also going to have a good rapport with these people because, um, Nobody likes it when a customer gives them a bunch of stuff that they weren't prepared to do or didn't want to or don't like to do or all kinds of emotional stuff that goes into that, okay? So I'm at zero on my scale. I don't know if you can see that from where you are, from where I have the camera. I had it zoomed in because I thought it was more important for you to see the sculpture and not even me so much. So let's go with another 200 because I can build up the rubber. I can also make a nice little edge going around here. And, um, you know, so it's not going to be wasted. On the other hand, I don't really want to waste a lot of this material because I almost have a full bucket still. And I certainly can use it for other things. All right, that's 150. That's probably enough. But let me just go ahead and go to the full 200 again. All right. So that's just a wee bit under 200, which is, I think, what I did the last time. And that may have been why that little bit of stuff. Now, I really want to close this, but I need a hammer to help me close it. But for right now, I'm just going to sort of pound on it with what I can do and try to minimize how much it gets um, air into it because it will not stay very long once the bucket actually is open because... There was air in there before because it's not filled to the top. You know, it's like a bag of potato chips. They only give you part of what you actually pay for. Um, but um, I don't want to exaggerate. So I'm trying to see here. But I'm, I'm kind of. it would be nicer if I had a scale that was really a lot more precise than these. And, and that's a bummer. But I'm trying to go with memory. I think I need maybe a wee bit more. All right. So I'm going to close this baby up. And you'll note that when I try to pick the, um, the two-part ingredients here out of the thing, I'm trying not to let that yellow touch this silver bowl because I'm trying to minimize my cleanup afterwards. As I mentioned before, I'm not really a fan of cleaning up and spending more time than I have to. Plus, also right now with my back injury, every washing thing that I do, every pushing thing that I, everything I do with my arms is painful. All right, so let's leave that there and try to get, just keep it out of the way. Oh, all right, so I have my little mustard sandwich. <laughs> White bread. <laughs> Gross. All right. I'm just being goofy, but you know, you kind of do what you got to do sometimes. And goofy is fun. As long as I'm not so goofy, I forget what I'm doing. Because that can happen too with a distraction. Okay. There's really no way to minimize my hands. I'm bummed out that the gloves didn't work because, man, it is so nice to have your hands clean when you pull them out of those gloves. But if this rubber was sticking to that latex, as I hope that you will will have seen in the first part of this video, um, I want to get that off of the sculpture. Do you see that with some of that... Um, the activator dropped down off of that because I hadn't mixed it before it dropped. So I wanted to remove that from the face because um, I don't want this texture to not be captured at that particular point. Now you can see that it's still parts yellow and white. So I'm going to keep kneading. And this is what's killing my spine right now. But there's no point in doing it if I don't at least attempt to do it right. I kind of feel like this color yellow here was a much better mixture than what I made there. So I'm a little bit worried that that's not going to pick up all that detail of the hair because if there's not enough of the activator and it, it's the rubber's never going to cure. But 
because they say between four and five percent, and I felt like I was pushing on the five percent. Um, I, my hope is that it will be good enough, but you know, it's, I'm not one of those people that really like good enough. I'm, I don't feel I'm a perfectionist, but I do feel like I shoot for perfection the same way I shoot for symmetry, knowing that I'm not going to get it and actually not needing to have it, if that makes any sense. Um, you know, it's like go for the high goal, but then don't be, don't beat yourself up when you miss the mark because really missing the mark wasn't really a horrible thing. So now be um, I want to first, I want to cover all the things that I had not covered before. And even though this simple shape, I don't want to get overly aggressive and put too much rubber in there because what it could do is have me miss something without realizing it, or even trapping an air bubble and not feeling it because the rubber is so thick. Okay. And what you, you probably can't see, but I'm also using my finger to push away from the wood. I think I will keep that hole in there for the mold just for registration. But also if you have too much materials in there that's solid, it's going to be harder to pull off the rubber when you want to pull it away from the mouth. And that's not really the point of the flexible mold. So you want those areas that need extra strength like you know you remember that your sculpture is going to be the opposite the mirror reflection of what the mold is so you need to think about which is going to be a high point which is difficult to pour wax into a place that's you know it's like how do you pour a max wax on top of a mountain peak for example because it's going to keep falling down the mountain you know what i mean that it falls away from the point the point has nothing to hold on to the wax and as you per turn in that the piece in different directions it's going to go falling off of that so because your first coat of wax also is going to be melted or you know, fairly liquid kind of thing um i had originally thought that this mold could work for anything i want to cast into but then later i remembered that terracotta clay wet water-based clay is going to have that suction effect. I mean, I say that because it's been a long, long time since I've worked with water-based clay and even longer time since I've made a mold of anything to cast um, clay worth. Terracotta means um, baked earth, by the way. Um, it's usually a red color, but I think they can also make that in that. Um, I'm not a ceramicist and I don't do labels very well, but I believe that terracotta also implies the red earth, like a burnt umber sort of implies that it's going to be a reddish color because it's burnt. And um, I'm not sure about that. I know ceramics have different levels. They have, you know, you have um, porcelain, which is a clay, but it's this very specific type of clay and it has its own personality. And I've understood from uh, many of my clay artist friends that porcelain is quite difficult to work with. And, uh, but when you get it, and it works. It's a gorgeous thing, isn't it? So, and that's the thing that people strive to make things better and better and better because we're, we creators generally want to go for beauty as well as function. And now while I'm doing this, I'm sort of keeping my eye on what I'm doing, but I'm kind of in a solid area. So I, I know that I'm pushing against a fair amount of material and I don't worry so much that it's going to go there because I haven't turned my fireplace on for tonight yet. I will have to later once it gets dark, it'll get cool in the house. But, um, and I want to keep this room temperature as consistent as possible for the, the rubber. Um, but I'm looking right now about how where I want to put extra rubber because I'm going to use everything that's in my hand. I'm not going to mix up a new thing because I don't feel that this particular sculpture is complicated enough to warrant needing to be overkill on the mold. And plus, I'm not actually sure if that's going to work, but you don't want to plan for failure in the sense that what if that mold actually does work and I didn't do a good job of it because I thought, oh, well, I'm probably going to have to do it again. Well, I don't want to do that. I want to I would rather see if I can make this work. Plus, there's no given that I would act, that I'll actually be able to sell any of these faces except to the customer who bought it. So, in one respect, that's a thing that I do that's not a smart business call because 
If you get a commission when somebody else asks you to make something, you should be smart and get all your money from that one sale because nothing is ever guaranteed. When I did the portrait of Stuart, I knew that I wasn't ever going to have two portraits of Stuart ever going to be made probably. I mean, what are the odds? But it's not it's not like he was a famous person like um, you know, Martin Luther King or something where he's going to have hopefully many sculptures that can be done around him and many people fans of what he was striving for in his life and all that, you know, you're going to have people that may want a portrait bust of him um, to put in their homes or to remember what he stood for and all this. Now, do you see from here, this, this is an undercut. From this point of view, I'm looking bird's eye down. That's a little undercut of rubber. If the fiberglass goes underneath that, it's, it's going to be hard and it's not going to come out. So I'll end up having to cut the rubber. And the thing is, you want the mother mold to touch every part of your rubber mold so that you get a good shape because the whole point of the mother mold is to support the softer flexible mold that has a detail. If you have to cut away part of your flexible mold just to get the thing out of it, then what's going to happen is you've got an airspace between the rubber and the fiberglass or the plaster, whatever you make the mother mold out of. And um, what that will do is... Uh, possibly give you a form that's a little bit dented in because the, the rubber is going to go towards the hard stuff. And um, I don't know if that's making any sense, but you want to be as precise as possible. See, now I want to make sure it's going straight up and down because I'm going to pull this away. But if I can make it a little bit this way and make sure that there's absolutely no undercut, that's nice. But I don't want to over exaggerate that because then it's going to be difficult for me to po pull the nose holes out. And that's another reason you don't need nose holes to be super deep either. Also, in this case, that's going to be underneath the sculpture. So it's very rare that somebody's going to be up looking up underneath it. I mean, maybe an artist would, but they can see that you did a shallow nose hole for certain reasons. In um, clay port in portraits with bronze and stuff, you don't necessarily want deep nose holes anyway, because the deeper the hole goes up into there, the darker the shadow is going to be. And it's just like a painting where um, a person exaggerates the nose hole. What happens? You get somebody puts in black nose holes because somehow they think, oh, it's a dark, it's a black. They put it in there and you go, oh, God, it gods. That's a little bit. Your eye goes straight to the high point of contrast, plus it being sort of in the center of your composition, likely. Um, you, you, the eye is just destined to go there. So you don't, because you, you're probably going to have a lighter colored skin. Even if you have a dark skinned person, you don't need to have black holes because most people have nose holes that are fairly, relatively speaking, in terms of where the light goes. They're, um, they're kind of more open. You know, if you want a really dark, shadow, you make a slit in something because the light doesn't enter very deeply into that and it reads from a distance as a dark line, okay? So I'm rambling on about stuff because I think for you to just watch my video might be a little dull, I don't know. Now, like I said, I could build up a side, but I don't really have enough clay for that. So what I want to do is reinforce the edges and again, I have a little piece of rubber coming out this way, and then I go under. So I want to make sure that I go close to the board to make sure that I don't have any little pieces sticking out over it that I have to go under. Because um, I want all of this supported. And I can feel now, I don't know if you can feel how sticky this is, or see how sticky it is, or whatever the sense you're going to use is. But it's starting to set up a lot more than it was at the beginning of this process. And that's fine. That's what it's supposed to be doing, right? So, I am, again, I'm doing my quality control of not having undercuts. So, let's touch around here. There's a little under on the chin. It's very easy to do an undercut because um, you're, if you don't change your point of view at times, 
you don't notice things. So on the breaks, when I, while I was cleaning my hands during each layer of the, the thing, I was actually walking around the sculpture to see what I had missed. And um, because different angles and different lighting situations are going to make all of that change for you. So again, I'm, I'm getting lower here, but and maybe put a little bit there on the eyebrow because I can sort of see the color of the clay. What I'm trying to avoid at this point also is I don't want the rubber to tear because after a lot of castings, um, sometimes you end up having to make another mold if a piece is so good. And the funny thing is, um, this being plastilina clay, the original, I don't need to keep this original around. Once I make a mold and I'm satisfied that I can make a good copy off of it, I can reuse this clay to make another sculpture, another composition. And ideally, that's the whole point of it, um, besides the fact that since it's not water-based clay, I don't have to babysit it as much. I don't have to keep it. You, you've probably read stories of Rodin having to make sure that his sculptures uh, in clay, water-based clay, stayed the proper amount of wetness so that they would be stiff enough to still hold the form that he put in, but still wet enough to be pliable. And um, you don't want your water-based clay to hard start hardening like air drying stuff really before you're ready for it to do that. So those are important things to know about your medium that you're working with. But anyway, um, a lot of times if people make a second mold, they usually have made a hard plaster copy of the original to keep that because frankly that will keep, other than being dropped, a plaster mold is gonna keep the shape really, really well, even better than clay, um, certainly better than a wax copy. Um, so the plaster copy can be used to then make a new mold from and you can keep making your mass produced pieces kind of thing. So that's your business side of things. I have a little hole there, but that hole there isn't going to matter because the mold's coming up this way, okay? It's kind of cool seeing the whole shape sort of glossed over. Now, I didn't make any registration holes in this the way I did in Stuart. If you saw the video for the Stuart mold, oops, I poked a hole in that, so I need to, that tells me that that was a little bit close to the surface right there. That was a little ridge on the hair. And, you know, what's happening is I'm picking it off my fingers with the, the other hand, but as soon as I go to apply it, it's staying on my finger more than it is going on to the clay. And that pretty much is a good sign that I'm done. Um, but I'm gonna I have to keep cleaning my hands and what do I have to lose? So, but I also want to look around. Now see, I don't like the undercut I had for the mouth there. Do you see? That was a little hole that the fiberglass would push into that hole and then I would have a problem. And I don't wanna do that. So I wanna come around here and make sure that everything is a slant that can come away easily, straight up, and fill in some of these pieces here. I did make the mouth go a little bit back because I wanted a shadow in there and um, that sort of thing, but I don't want to have the fiberglass mold be stuck, but I'm a little bit worried because when I look straight down, I, I see a little bit of dent there and now I'm out of rubber and I don't trust myself to rob rubber from like any other place right now because it's already starting to set up and, you know, I'll just say deal with it, what it is, what it is. You know, the nice thing is that if I'm going to make my copies in clay and cement, um, I will have another opportunity to fix it. But again, the whole point of making mold is to not have to do your work more than absolutely necessary. At least with this, this is a one-part mold. I won't have seam lines. I won't have to worry about hollowness, thickness. And, I mean, yeah, you do that anyway, especially in clay. But the cement, it won't matter. Um, I haven't done cement since about 1997, perhaps. Maybe 96 in Austin, Texas. And um, I think Lynn Olson is the name of the teacher who taught cement there with our, at our sculpture school where I used to teach anatomy. And um, I really miss those days at the Elizabeth Ney Sculpture Conservatory. And um, that was really depressing when we lost the school there due to politics, I think. Um, but anyway, that's another subject, and I 
probably shouldn't speak of it because I was on the sidelines of it, but I didn't, I wasn't in on the priviness for all the details that were happening. So I have my own theories about what happened, but that's what they are, theories. And many of those people may not be around anymore anyway, so what's the point? All right. Thank you for watching. This mold, I'm going to let it sit at least overnight, and I'll see what it looks like in the morning. But I would really love to finish the fiberglass, but it also depends on how my back is doing, because if I go to sit down to make dinner or whatever in an hour or two, or I don't even know what time it is. Oh, it's only five o'clock. So more than likely, I'm going to go lie down for a little bit once I get my hands clean enough to touch things. And um, we'll see. But if I've done my back a really bad harm from doing all this mushing and stuff, then I may wait another day to do this. But otherwise, I want to do... I want to finish this as much as, po as quickly as possible because I know for the client to get this sculpture that they've waited for since April, you know, before my accident happened in July, but I was still sculpting and stuff and I wasn't finished with the face by the time I had the accident. So it had to wait and they've been so patient and um, I wanted to get it done by Christmas, but that was unrealistic. And But the thing is, when I do the terracotta, I still have to find around this area who's going to fire it for me. And with the cement that I can do directly, and that'll set up here, I haven't done cement sculpture in so long that I'm going to have to spend some time researching how, how to do that. And talking to my colleagues, I had already done that to see that instead of having little pieces of stainless steel in there, I can just use a plastic sort of netting. So the, the may not be different technology, but it's just a method that I don't remember hearing of plastic. I thought you had to put metal in concrete for it to be setting up well. Anyway, I'm rambling on and on, and let's stop this for now. Are you still with me? <laughs> Ciao. Thank you.